Good evening and welcome to a special election night edition of Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman. Mayor Lori Lightfoot will not get a second term. With well more than 97% of precincts reporting, Paul Vallis and Brandon Johnson are headed for the April 4th runoff. Earlier tonight, the mayor conceded to Vallis and Johnson. Joining us now from the election night headquarters of the top three candidates are our own Paris Schutz, Amanda Vinicky, and Nick Blumberg. Amanda, let's start with you. You're reporting live from the Paul Vallis election night headquarters. Yes, Brandis, Paul Vallis election night headquarters called City Hall. And this is the West Loop event space, not, of course, the government building where Vallis hopes to occupy the fifth floor come May. But his supporters, Vallis himself has left the building, but his supporters are feeling happy and they are feeling confident, of course, with his front runner status, uh, approximately 35% of the vote. We did hear from Paul Vallis in the 9 o'clock hour, and he continued to hammer on what his folks say was really what put him across the finish line there, and that is a focus on crime and public safety. Public safety is the fundamental right of every American. It is a civil right. And it is the principal responsibility of government. And we will have a safe Chicago. We will make Chicago the safest city in America. And Vallis made that speech after some bagpipes played on stage and an introduction from one of his key supporters in the city council, and that is 44th Ward Alderman Tom Tunney. Thanks for joining us. Now, what is it that you think is going to help Vallis not just be the victor of this race, but how does he get more than 50% of the vote in a general election? Well, I think his message is very, very clear and resonates with Chicagoans. Public safety is number one, two, and three issue in my neighborhood and on the south side and on the west side. So I think his plan to boost not only resources, but the morale of the police department. And I believe we'll have a new police superintendent. So, um, you know. Is that where Mayor Lori Lightfoot went wrong? I don't, you know what? The mayor has her discretion to lead the police department. Um, so I'm, I never called for his resignation, but you know, the new mayor gets to make the choice and obviously the police commander is probably the number one choice for him to make. Uh, number two is education, which I think he's got a strong point there. You know? So and, does Vallis have a chance? Do you think he could be our mayor? Oh, he, no, he definitely has a chance. In fact, I would say it on record, it's his to lose. And there we have it from Alderman Tom Tunney, sending it back to you in the studio. Amanda, thanks so much. And of course, joining Paul Vallis in that race is Brandon Johnson. We head now to Nick, who is at Johnson's election night headquarters. Hey, Nick. Hey, Brandis. It is certainly a jubilant crowd here. The music has been loud all night. There have been some impromptu dance parties that broke out before uh, Commissioner Brandon Johnson and many elected officials, family members, other supporters took the stage. We heard from Commissioner Johnson. He wrapped up just about 10 or 15 minutes ago with his victory speech as he heads toward this runoff. Here's a bit of what he had to say. So I want to thank all the Chicagoans who made this happen. You went door to door. You made phone calls. Some of y'all have been harassing y'all family members for months. As the next mayor of the city of Chicago, I apologize to all of the family members who received multiple text messages from your cousin, your auntie, your pastor, your grandmother. Thank you. Because what you did, you turned our hope into reality because you believe that a better Chicago is possible. Brandis, we're joined now by Chicago Teachers Union President Stacy Davis-Gates, who's been a big backer of Commissioner Johnson. How do you feel about his chances as the commissioner heads into this runoff? I am so happy for us as residents of Chicago that we get a father and a husband, a teacher and an organizer to love us, invest in us, 
to keep us safe and to build a stronger, a better Chicago. You know, some of the, the supporters who, uh, so rather the detractors who have uh, come after Brandon Johnson have said, you know, all this heavy teachers union support is, is cause for concern. He's going to be negotiating, you know, contracts potentially should he be end up on the fifth floor. How do you respond to that? You know, Chicago Teachers Union members educate our youth every single day in this city. They help to keep them safe. We raise our children here. We're 80% women. We own homes. We rent apartments. We are your tax base. We are people who deserve to have a Chicago that fully invests in us, our school communities, the students we serve, and their families. All right, Teachers Union President Stacey Davis-Gates, thank you so much for taking some time. We appreciate it. And Brandis, the crowd is starting to thin out here, but there are still plenty of people on their feet celebrating Brandon Johnson as he appears to head to an April runoff for Chicago's mayoral election. We'll have more later, but for now, back to you. Nick, thanks. We'll see you later. It sounds like there's definitely a party going on there. Uh, now let's head over to Paris where it looks a little bit quieter. Uh, he is at the election night headquarters of incumbent mayor Lori Lightfoot, Paris. That's right, Brandis. It's a more subdued atmosphere here at the Carpenters Hall in River North. And about an hour and a half ago, the assembled supporters witnessed history, although it wasn't the kind of history that they came here to see. Mayor Lori Lightfoot officially becomes the first mayor to lose re-election since Jane Byrne to Harold Washington 40 years ago. So at about 8.45, she took the stage with her wife, Amy Eshelman, to deliver the news. Uh, I've called Brandon Johnson and Paul Vallis uh, to congratulate them on their victories in advancing uh, to the runoffs. And I'm joined now by a longtime Lightfoot supporter, 32nd uh, Ward Alderman Finance Committee Chair uh, Scott Wagesbeck. Scott, what, what happened today? Why couldn't she crack the top two? Uh, I think it was uh, people speaking out. It's a democratic process, and they voted for two other people. Um, and I think, you know, we, we have to abide by that. We have to continue to move the city forward, though. She lost a lot of her former allies. Not you. You stuck with her. You were one of her first allies. Why, why is that? We got a lot done, uh, a lot of things that I had been working for for many years prior, uh, in prior administrations under Emanuel, under Daley. Uh, this mayor made sure that a lot of the things we had been fighting for on the progressive front, but also on the city finances and the reforms that we needed, that we were moving forward on. A couple specifics on that. Uh, well, workers' comp reform and the finance committee. Um, we were able to also work with her very closely to make sure that the city finances in terms of our ratings went up. When we look at the ethics reforms in the city council, that was the biggest fight at all, and I think of all, and I think that's where Alderman really kind of pushed back against her because we have institutions that don't want to change in this city, and that's where the big pushback was. All right, and very quickly, do you know who you're going to be with, Vallis versus Johnson? No, I really need to hear substance from people and not just uh, platitudes. So we really need to see what they're going to put on the table and how they're going to move the city forward. All right, Alderman Scott Wagesbeck, thanks very much. All right, Brandis, we toss it back to you. Of course, Paris, and of course, we'll uh, check back in with you and our other reporters who are out in the field a little bit later on. In terms of voter turnout, though, the word of the day has been sluggish. Joining us now to talk about that and more is Max Bever, Director of Public Information for the Chicago Board of Elections. Max, thanks for joining us. I know it's a long night over there. Uh, so early voting was up, but overall today's voting was down compared to the, the 2019 election. Have voters shifted their voting habits? It sure looks like Brandis, and I might have been overly optimistic taking a look at our record-breaking early voting and especially vote-by-mail turnout leading up to Election Day. But what it looks like is that we've got the same amount of voters that we did in 2019 and 2015, but a lot more are choosing to vote by mail ever than before. Uh, so drilling down in your numbers a little bit, was vote by mail the preferred method of voting early? It was, and we received already 112,000 vote by mail ballots back. And so those, that's everything that we received as of last night, Monday the 27th. That's what's included in tonight's election results. But we do have over 100,000 vote by mail ballots that are still outstanding. Uh, so we do expect about 60 to 80,000 of those to return back, uh, both return today and over the next immediate three to four days. Uh, we have until March 14th to count all of them, but it'll be this weekend that we have a clear uh, picture of the vast majority of those vote by mail ballots. We will count and process them uh, as they come in and they will be reflected in the unofficial results uh, on, a, a, on an updated basis day by day. Uh, 
Um, that's going to affect more of the ward uh, races at this point, because a lot of the alder person races get pretty close uh, between double digits or single digits. And those remaining uh, vote by mail ballots out there can sway some of those races. And to that point, Max, you know, we obviously know who is heading to the April 4th runoff uh, for the mayor's race. Um, are there any of those aldermanic races that uh, will not be decided tonight? A good number of those uh, that uh, are close to 50%, if uh, if that incumbent or that older person or that candidate didn't get 50% plus one, um, it will remain to see how close a lot of these races are. Um, I have a feeling that a good man, many of the campaigns are going to want to wait until the majority of the votes are counted or even until after March 14th. Okay, and uh, any recounts that you might anticipate, Max? It doesn't look like at this point, uh, especially you know, uh, at the uh, citywide or the mayoral level. We'll see where we get uh, a bit closer. Uh, we do plan to have the official proclamation of results done as quickly as we can, uh, either by the 15th or the 16th. Uh, we've got to turn around those ballots, print those ballots, get early voting open, get those vote by mail ballots out, and get this all ready to have voters vote again on April 4th. More to come. We'll see you before April 4th, I'm sure. Thank you, Max Bever. Thank you. So uh, to get to a little bit of election night analysis, we have got uh, political speech writer, debate strategist, and senior lecturer at Northwestern University, Jason DeSanto, joining us, and our very own political reporter, Heather Sharon. Thanks to you both, both for being here. So it looks like Paul Vallis, he really pulled ahead in this race. Jason, why do you think his message was so effective? He found people where they were. I mean, this is a city that emotionally, across many different communities, had identified for themselves the crime and public safety was the major issue. He spoke to that directly in a very stark way. Also leavened that message a little bit with kind of his walkish demeanor and that biography that he has. And I think that allowed him to do well with southwest side, northwest side wards, lock down those areas, but also begin to penetrate into the lakefront areas as well. And that's what got him to 35 percent tonight. Uh, so we've got the, the matchup here. It's Vallis versus Johnson, right? We know that Paul Vallis has been endorsed by the Paternal Order of Police and Brandon Johnson endorsed by the Chicago Teachers Union. Kind of conservative versus progressive look. Heather, how's this race going to look? So this is the most clear choice that Chicago voters really have had in quite a while, if ever. This is a choice between the man who once ran the Chicago Public Schools and an organizer for the Chicago Teachers Union. The clarity between the two candidates will be stark. And while we sort of had a first round of voting where we had sort of, you know, seven candidates that were some flavor of progressive, you know, define it how you want, we now have a clear progressive, the most progressive candidate in the race versus the most conservative candidate in the race. And a lot of times people will shorthand the political divide in Chicago by saying CTU versus the FO. And that is exactly what we have here in this April 4 runoff, which will really not only shape Chicago's future for the next four years, but really define Chicago's progressive community. Uh, Jason, what went wrong for Mayor Lightfoot? Well, here's the issue. 71% wrong track number for people in terms of how they think the city is doing. And when you're the incumbent, you wear the jacket on that. What she did well was to eventually go after Brandon Johnson, go after Chewy Garcia. And in some respects, maybe some of those appeals worked a little bit on each. They certainly worked with respect to Garcia. But the problem is in a multi-candidate race, you have to give people a reason to vote for you, not just to devalue somebody else. And she never really did that. I never really felt like she had a message that positioned her in the political spectrum in the middle of the left and right that Heather just identified. And to me, that was always the way for her to be heard on an emotional level so that then she could tell people that really progress has been made. I just don't think people were ready to hear that message. And without positioning herself between others, really she was left with a lot of numbers, facts, figures, and not really a receptive audience for that right now. I, I think it, it's worth taking a moment and realizing that this is the same woman who four years ago won nearly 75 percent of the vote in the second round of voting. She won every ward and really took office with what she said was a mandate. And the question that we will be grappling with in the next several weeks and months as she prepares to leave office is, did she fail to fulfill those promises? Somebody like Brandon Johnson would say yes, but she, I think, will have a more nuanced argument and say, look, I led the city through the COVID 
COVID pandemic. I led them through the uprising after the police murder of George Floyd. I did the best I could under the circumstances, and she will hope that we will reevaluate her time in office with a little bit more clarity. And, and just to segue off of that, what Heather said is right about her pulling down over 70% of the vote several years ago, because I think at that time people knew what she stood for. She was a trailblazing candidate, first African-American woman to be mayor, LGBTQ community to be mayor, and also very strong on ethics as well, running against the machine. On this election night four years ago, when she got up there to give her speech, getting into the runoff, she talked about fighting against the machine. This time around, I wasn't sure that I knew what she stood for other than having all the scars of the battles. And that's important, but it's not important enough when you think about the two people who are in the top two right now you know exactly what they both stand for. And it is a stark choice, as Heather described it, and that's what people really chose. And I, I want to talk about, you know, where the other voters, where they're going to land later on, but we're going to come back to that uh, in, in just a little bit. Uh, my thanks to Heather Sharon and Jason DeSanto for joining us. But now I want to check back in uh, with Paris Schutz at Lori Lightfoot's election night headquarters. Paris. Brannis, it certainly was a humbled Mayor Lightfoot when she took the stage at about 8.40 this evening. She called this job the honor of her lifetime despite not winning re-election. She talked about the historic nature of her mayoralship. She was the first female African-American to be mayor of the city of Chicago. She talked about the investments in the south and west side that she marshaled, saying that those need to continue, whoever the next mayor is. And there were supporters here. It was a, a small room, about two-thirds full. I saw trade union members, I saw Congressman Bobby Rush, I saw the head of the Illinois Restaurant Association and uh, Treasurer Melissa Conyers Irvin. I talked to Treasurer Conyers Irvin and asked her why she thought the mayor could not get into that runoff tonight. We're going to sit down and talk to both of them. I mean, we're looking for uh, uh, have a seat at the table. I think it's important for whoever becomes the mayor to uh, listen out, I mean, give them an opportunity to uh, express our concerns, opinions. We want a better working environment, but we also want a great, uh, a thriving city, and we want to welcome more business to the city. This is the first black woman mayor of this city. I am a black woman born and raised in this city. I, my six-year-old daughter asked me tonight, did the people vote for the mayor? My daughter, a young black girl. It doesn't go unnoticed for me that history has been made. Kanye Zervin, by the way, won her re-election as city treasurer, saying there will be a legacy and a positive one, she believes, for Mayor Lightfoot. And as for the Illinois Restaurant Association, one of many groups now trying to figure out where they throw their support here over the next month uh, during this mayoral runoff. A lot at stake for so many groups, businesses, unions. And Brandis, I will toss it back to you. A lot of folks, Paris, figuring out where to, where to put their support uh, in time for April 4th. Thank you. Uh, now we check back in with Amanda at the Paul Vallis Election Night Headquarters. Hey, Amanda. Hey there, Brandis. Yes, Paul Vallis did actually give a shout out to Mayor Lightfoot saying that it takes a lot of guts to be a public servant and asked everybody to give her a round of applause and thanks. He did speak with her this evening. Vallis, when he spoke to this very exuberant crowd who's still getting their party on even though he has left the premises, also, of course, focused on what has been the hallmark of his campaign, and that is public safety, also schools. Now, critics are trying to cast Vallis as a sort of closet conservative, but Vallis already trying to combat that attack and playing up his Democratic bona fides. I supported marriage equality when they called it gay marriage. You cannot erase the record. I also spoke this evening with Vallis's campaign manager, Joe Trippi, who said that public safety is going to continue to be the message that Vallis spreads. He says that that is first and foremost, but another focus of the campaign heading into the runoff, he says, is going to be separating Vallis from Johnson. Vallis, he says, is going to be sure to tell voters that he will hold the line on taxes. With that, back to you. Amanda, thank you. Uh, so another party that I suspect is still going on is where Nick Blumberg is at the Brandon Johnson Election Night Headquarters. Hey, Nick. 
Hey, Brandis. Unfortunately, the great tunes are off. The crowd is starting to thin out, but there are still plenty of people here celebrating Cook County Commissioner Brandon Johnson's win. Uh, he took the stage a little while ago, shortly after a chance of CT who? CTU. There are a lot of teachers, union, and education supporters here. He spoke about how his time teaching in a school in Cabrini Green was a big motivator for him to become an organizer, how he saw some of the disinvestment that many parts of Chicago have historically faced. Here's a bit of what he had to say. I know what a disinvested community looks like because I taught in Cabrini Green, USA. And our children from Cabrini Green could see and touch and practically walk to one of the wealthiest neighborhoods in the entire city of Chicago from their back windows and out of their front windows bulldozers staring them down, preparing to destroy their public housing. It ain't right. It captures the essence of the city of Chicago, this tale of two cities. But that's why I'm looking forward to becoming the next mayor of the city of Chicago. And obviously education is a centerpiece issue of Johnson's campaign, but supporters we talked to raised many other issues that motivated them to vote for him. Public safety, transportation, economics, those are obviously all going to be huge issues heading into the April runoff as Johnson tries to build support against Paul Ballas. Brandis. Okay, Nick Lumberg, thanks to you and our teams out in the field. We're back now in-house, though, with Jason and Heather. Um, Jason, how do you see, you know, the, the candidates who lost tonight, Lightfoot, Garcia, Wilson, how do you see them sort of marshalling uh, their support behind one of these two frontrunners? It could be wait and see, and I'm not sure that their voters are going to track exactly where we might initially think they're going to go. I mean, I think the Lightfoot voters are an interesting breed of voter in this particular race and where they might head. I think we're apt to hear maybe Johnson pick up the mantle of Harold Washington that Lightfoot was using in the closing days of the campaign and start to talk, despite being a candidate really about the future, different generation, really talk a lot about the 1980s and also the 1990s and Paul Vallis's history with the Chicago Public Schools and pensions. He started that tonight, Johnson did with his speech. He's done it in the debates when there were nine candidates up there. I think he's going to continue along with that, and we'll see what voters decide once they start hearing those contrasts. You know, the candidate that I think a lot of folks, you know, uh, expected to see more of, but he was also the candidate who was latest in the race. He was the latest to go up on air with ads. Chewy Garcia, Heather, what happened here? Well, you're right. He got into the, the race late, and once he did get into the race, really his first policy proposal was focused on public safety because that was the whole issue, the whole game, and his plan was not really all that much different than Lori Lightfoot's. Now he said, look, I will execute. I, there will be, I will provide leadership where the mayor has failed. But just like Jason was saying about Lightfoot's pits to voters, that is a really difficult message to get across in such a crowded field. And also, I think that the last time Chuy Garcia ran a, a, a really contested race was 2015. That was nearly a decade ago. And he's been in Congress now for, you know, a full term, and it is difficult to sort of shift from being a congressperson to being one of nine candidates and I think that transition was perhaps a little bit rougher than he and his supporters thought. Heather also uh, city council look a little different this time? It's going to look very different this time. Twelve older people are retiring, so that means that nearly a quarter of the city council will look different in May 2023 than it did in May 2019. Several very progressive candidates won tonight, but other very progressive candidates lost, including Louise Buwani in the 50th ward. However, Byron Sigcho Lopez, he appears to have won in the 25th ward, and he withstood uh, just millions of dollars in spending from business aligned groups hoping to knock him and other members of the Democratic Socialists of America off the City Council. Also apparently winning tonight was Rosanna Rodriguez Sanchez, the author of the Treatment Not Trauma policy that we're going to hear a lot about from Brandon Johnson, as well as other socialist members. Apparently sort of close to that 50% plus one mark, Daniel Laspada in the first ward where um, Alder, former Alderman Proco Joe Moreno's bid for a comeback was roundly rejected by voters. Jason DeSanto heading towards April 4th. What are you going to be looking for and expecting to hear from candidates? I think we started to hear tonight with the contrast in the speech. Vallis has not really gone after any other candidates all the way through these early races. 
Johnson has. He used his speech tonight to start to do that. One thing I thought was really interesting between the two candidates, they both talked about their families. Vallis used that family appeal to talk about service and safety. Johnson used it to talk about opportunity and equality. And I think that very well defines where these two candidates are coming from over the next few weeks. Heather, what about you? So I think that we are going to really sort of see a robust debate over what public safety means in Chicago. Is yeah. it one where you don't have to worry about carjackings or street robberies, or is public safety really focused on police reform and ending the Chicago okay. Police Department's decades of problems? Lots to talk about between now and then. My thanks to Jason DeSanto and Heather Sharon. Thanks, Brandis. We're back to wrap things up right after this. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols, the Jim and Kay Maybe family, the Polk Brothers Foundation, and the support of these donors. And that is our show for this election night. Our coverage continues online at WTTW.com slash news. And please join us tomorrow night live at 10. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. Thanks for watching. Stay healthy and safe and have a good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a proud sponsor of diversity, equity, and inclusion-focused free continuing legal education for lawyers throughout the region.